Hello everyone, welcome to this special video presentation. Uh, joining me today is Professor Steve Webb from the Monash University School of Public Health and Preventative Medicine and the uh, Principal Investigator for the REMAP CAP study. Steve, welcome to the video. Thanks very much, Todd. Wonderful to be speaking with you today. Steve, the REMAP CAP study has been going for some years now. Why was it started in the first place? Uh, I, well, I guess there's two reasons, Todd. The, the first is uh, the purpose for which it exists um, between pandemics, which is just to improve outcome for patients with severe community acquired pneumonia. But it was always established with a secondary objective, which was to be able to pivot as rapidly as possible to generate evidence to improve outcomes uh, during a pandemic. Many of the investigators that are associated with remap cap uh, had the experience of looking after patients, as well as trying to conduct time critical research during the 2009 H1N1 swine flu uh, pandemic. And we learned an enormous amount about what needed to be done, uh, preferably as far in advance as possible to be able to conduct research during a pandemic. Steve, what sort of information do you collect during, this, um, the, during the trial? So it is a trial. What that means is that the um, treatment allocations that patients receive is determined by randomization. Randomization means that the uh, trial allows what we refer to as valid causal inference, which is that any difference in outcome between patients who've been randomized to different treatment options can be legitimately attributed to the um, randomization uh, allocation. Many other types of studies uh, look at the um, ad hoc distribution of treatments and try and infer uh, um, treatment effect from those allocations, uh, but randomization ensures that this can be done validly. There are a number of other design features of remap cap that were put in place uh, for a future pandemic, which allow remap cap to answer questions uh, quickly and efficiently. So what are some of the differences between this and other trials that are out there being done on um, features of the COVID-19 outbreak? So there are really four features, uh, Todd. Um, the first is that most other trials are simply comparing um, two alternative treatments. Remap cap is what's referred to as a multifactorial trial. So in the same trial and in the same patients, we're evaluating the impact of different types of antiviral, different types of immune modulation, the effectiveness of steroids, and the role of macrolides. And in the near future, we're looking to add many more domains, potentially the role of heparin, vitamin C, convalescent uh, sera, uh, and statins. Uh, and so uh, if the analogy I'm allowed is, um, if you're looking for a, uh, an effective treatment, if the analogy that I'll be permitted is to say that the more tickets you have in the lottery, the more likely you are to find an, a, a treatment uh, that is actually effective. The, the second component um, is that it uses really very clever stats. Most trials have to have a, a fixed sample size and you're not allowed to analyze the trial until you've recruited the predetermined number of patients. REMAP-CAT looks at this from a completely different angle, which is how many patients need to be recruited to have a statistically confident answer. If it's this many, we recruit uh, a larger number. If it's a small number, we stop recruiting as soon as we've reached statistical confidence. And that's another way in which if there is an effective treatment within the platform, it's able to be detected as quickly as possible. The third element comes from the jumble of all of those interventions. In a normal trial, there's a lot of variation in background care, and the trial is just comparing two possible treatments. In remap cap, because so many of the component treatments are being allocated randomly, we can actually identify combinations that are effective, including combinations that wouldn't show up in a conventional trial. One of the possibilities that we're very interested in is the possibility that some types of immune modulation are effective, 
but that effectiveness is contingent on also administering an effective antiviral therapy. And it may be that a trial of antiviral doesn't show any benefit, a trial of immune modulation doesn't show any benefit. It's only when both domains are in the same trial that the treatment effect becomes apparent. I said there were four elements that are um, unique uh, to remap cap. And the last element is in many ways the best element, which is that the participants in remap cap benefit from participation, or at least they have the possibility of benefit. We use a thing which is a very long term, but it's called response adaptive randomization. Because the trial is analyzing results frequently, we can change the proportion of patients receiving each intervention. And we do that so that interventions that are looking like they're effective are actually allocated to more participants within the trial. So it's not just generation of evidence, it's also simultaneous implementation of evidence. And if there are effective treatments within the platform, more patients will have better outcomes. Steve, how likely is it, do you think, that the results of remap cap will influence the delivery of care during the pandemic? It's been designed very much to generate uh, answers uh, for uh, patients on a global basis during the pandemic. I, I, I don't think anyone knows uh, how long this is going to last for. Uh, I, I certainly have great optimism that there will be an effective vaccine and we all want that vaccine to be available uh, as soon as possible, but it could be 12 or 15 or 18 months before a vaccine is available. We've seen the experience in other countries of very intense waves of activity, but in previous pandemics, albeit in influenza, we've seen second and third waves of infection in places uh, that have had a first wave. And it's also possible that the uh, social distancing that we've had the fantastic opportunity in Australia to implement before we had an outbreak that was out of control to a smouldering outbreak that lasts uh, as long as a year or longer. We are hopeful that the first results can be emerging from remap cap within the next three to four months and are available to guide patient care during the pandemic. Finally, Steve, who's involved in the study and where is the funding to run the study come from? Uh, it's a massive international uh, effort. Um, it was a very slow trial to get running. Um, uh, there's a lot of complexity under the bonnet and it took us a long time to manage uh, that complexity. And so at many of our international meetings, the standing joke was that we had more investigators than we did patients randomised. Uh, we crossed that threshold about uh, nine months ago. Uh, we're on the way, we think, to as many as 100 or 150 sites. And if we get to that number, we'll have more sites than we do investigators. But there's a team based in the United Kingdom, in Ireland, in Netherlands, in Canada, in the United States, Australia uh, and New Zealand. And in terms of funding, sorry, it's, um, it's, it's acquiring um, substantial additional funding at the moment uh, to support the expansion that's occurring. But it was uh, from the National Health and Medical Research Council, in New Zealand from the Health Research Council, in the European Union from a um, funding scheme known as the FP7, and in Canada by their national funder, the Canadian Institutes for Health Research. Professor Steve Webb, thank you very much for joining us on the video today and congratulations on, uh, on getting up the trial up and going. Thanks very much, Todd. Much appreciated.